This is Dr. Jerry Tennant. Today I'd like to discuss with you the issue of the physics of emotions and the role of emotions in chronic disease. Before I do that, however, I must disclose uh, my interests. I may hold uh, patents on certain medical devices and receive royalties from my devices and books. I often have travel expenses supported by Synergy Medical Group and others, and I may receive an honorarium. It is likely that anything that is attached to my name that I will have an interest in that subject or that device. I always begin my lectures by noting that Tenet Institute is a private expressive association as defined by law and is under the direction of Jerry Tenet, MD, MDH, PSCD. This lecture is given under the auspices of my Arizona MDH license and not my Texas MD license, partially with the support of contribution by Synergy Medical Group. Participation in the seminar implies that the participant is given an acknowledgement of the rights noted above and others recognized by law and asserts first, ninth, and 14th Amendment rights. Participation means I voluntarily license Jerry Tennant to counsel me with his Arizona MD license. The concepts presented here were contributed by many people, but particularly by the staff of Tenet Institute, namely Ellen Amar, Gregory Hyde, and Amy Marshall. The concepts were also contributed to by Eileen McCusick, who wrote the wonderful book, Tuning the Human Biofield. So what are emotions? Everyone has them, but few can define what they are. The dictionary definition is emotion in everyday speech is any relatively brief conscious experience characterized by intense mental activity and a high degree of pleasure or displeasure. Scientific discourse has drifted to other meetings and there is no consensus on a definition. Emotion is often intertwined with mood, temperament, personality, disposition, and motivation. So we can agree that some emotions are helpful and some are harmful in our day-to-day -day life. It's great to laugh when it's socially acceptable, but harmful to laugh in other situations. It is often helpful to cry when we have a significant loss, but it is not helpful to cry at every little disturbance in our environment. It is not helpful to cry because you burned the toast or your shoelaces came untied. We cannot get through life without emotional events. We all have losses. Loved ones die or disappoint us. Our dreams go unfulfilled. We go bankrupt, we have accidents and suffer injuries, etc., etc. We now have an epidemic of soldiers committing suicide and having post-traumatic stress disorder. Here are the signs and symptoms of PTSD, and many people have some combination of these, not only soldiers, but many people in their day-to-day -day struggle to get through life. The statistics are rather astounding. 70% of adults in the U.S. have experienced some type of traumatic events at least once in their lives. This equates to approximately 223.4 million people. Up to 20% of these people go on to develop PTSD. As of today, that equates to approximately 44.7 million people who were or are struggling with PTSD. Risk of suicide among U.S. military members following Operation Enduring Freedom or Operation Iraqi Freedom deployment and separation from the U.S. military is a publication about suicide with our uh, returning soldiers. Uh, this Time magazine uh, cover shows uh, suicides at one a day, however now it's up to 20 a day. The, this article's conclusions are that findings do not support association between deployment and suicide mortality in this cohort. Early military separation of less than four years and discharge that is not honorable were suicide risk factors. 
To understand the link between deployment and suicide, Rieger and colleagues analyzed military records for more than 3.9 million service members in active or reserve duty in support of the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan at any point from October 7, 2001 to December 31, 2007. A total of 39,962 deaths occurred, including 5,041 suicides by December 31, 2009. So the suicide rates per 100,000 person years of, uh, were of 18.86 and 17.78 in those who um, were deployed. Leaving the military significantly increased suicide risk. However, a suicide rate of 26.06 after separation from service compared with 15.12 for those who remained in uniform. Those who left sooner had a greater risk with a rate of 48.04 among those who spent less than a year in the military. Pharmaceuticals are not a very effective treatment for PTSD and or suicide. And here's uh, studies that support the, that concept. And the Cochrane group found the following, quote, we found no evidence to support the efficacy of propranolol, enderol, uh, escadalpram, elixipro, temazepram, restoril, a benzodiazepine hypnotic agent, or gabapentin, neurotin, in preventing PTSD onset. In my experience, treatment failures usually mean it's the wrong paradigm. Now, I would remind you of my personal journey. I'm the ophthalmologist that did the majority of the research for the Visex later uh, used in LASIK surgery. Doing so caused me to inhale virus and get encephalitis and a bleeding disorder called idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. The specialists at Harvard and the National Institutes of Health could not help me. I spent about seven years in bed, sleeping about 16 hours a day from 1995 to 2002. I realized that I needed to reevaluate the chemistry paradigm I was taught in medical school. As soon as I realized that everything in the universe is based in physics, not chemistry, I began to get well. When two hydrogen ions want to join with an oxygen to form water, they exchange electrons. The movement of electrons is physics. Physics always precedes chemistry. Now, the human body is an electronic device. Any cellular biology book will tell you that cells are designed to run at a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. pH is the measurement of voltage in a liquid or in a solution. A pH of 7.35 is the same as minus 20 millivolts of electron donor, or 7.45 is minus 25 millivolts of electron donor. If you put an electrode inside a cell membrane and one on the outside of the cell membrane, you measure about 90 uh, millivolts. So the ways you measure voltage in a liquid is to use a sophisticated voltmeter called a pH meter. And it has a switch on it where you can switch it. So it'll either read in uh, millivolts or it'll read in uh, pH units, which is a logarithmic uh, scale of millivolts. By convention, if the liquid is an electron stealer, you put a plus sign in front of the voltage. If it's an electron donor, you put a minus sign in front of the voltage. Then you convert the voltage that you read to a logarithmic scale that runs from 0 to 14 and call it pH. Plus 400 millivolts is a synonym of a pH of 0. Minus 400 millivolts of electron donor is a, a synonym of a pH of 14. If the solution is neutral, you call it a pH of 7. So as I mentioned, cells need minus 25 millivolts of electron donor to run correctly and minus 50 millivolts of electron donor to make new cells. Essentially, all chronic disease is characterized by having inadequate voltage. The other important thing to realize is that we're constantly wearing ourselves out and having to make new cells. Different sources give us slightly different times for the replacement of various organs. The studies are based on tissue turnover time from natural stable isotope labeling. It varies according to bomb testing. As you can see in this diagram, you can get an idea of how often things change 
DNA renews itself every two months, your skin rebuilds itself every month, your liver about every six weeks, the lining of your stomach every five days, your brain rebuilds itself every year, your blood rebuilds itself every four months, and your body builds a whole new skeleton in three months. So the point is that chronic disease only occurs when we lose the ability to make new cells that work. Let me say that one more time. Chronic disease only occurs when we lose the ability to make new cells that work. So what does it take to make a new cell that work? Well, cells run at minus 25 millivolts, but it requires minus 50 millivolts to make new cells. Plus, we need all the materials that are necessary to make new cells. This is called nutrition and requires a functional digestive system, including stomach acid. We must also deal with any toxins that destroy cells as fast as we make them. The most common toxins are heavy metals like mercury, dental toxins, GMO foods with a pesticide called Roundup or glyphosate. <coughs> so what is the body's voltage system? Well, the body has uh, at least four battery packs. Our muscles are rechargeable battery packs. So our muscles are what are called piezoelectric which means that when you stress them, they, they emit electrons and they're also rechargeable batteries. And then the fascia that surrounds the muscle serves as the body's wiring system. Next, our cell membranes are small batteries called capacitors. And inside the cell, we have mitochondria and inside the mitochondria, we have a rechargeable battery system called ATP when it's charged up and ADP when it's discharged. And then our DNA has its own battery system using scalar energy. So this graphic was created by Dr. Altubiak to demonstrate these battery packs. So you can see uh, here uh, that we have these large muscles, battery packs. So our muscles are stacked in a very specific order, one on top of each other, surrounded by a common stocking of fascia to form a battery pack. So every organ has its own battery pack. Uh, the electrons in these battery packs are then available to the cell membranes, which are actually small batteries called capacitors. Our cell membranes are made up of opposing pairs of phospholipids, uh, and they have a ball, which is electron, uh, a electron conductor, and legs, which are electron insulators. And when you put two conductors separated by an insulator, you have a capacitor, which has the ability to store electrons. Then once we go inside the cells, we have the mitochondria, and when uh, the uh, mitochondrial battery pack is charged up, it's called ATP, and when it's discharged, it's called ADP. And then we have the DNA. The DNA was uh, f uh, first discovered as far as its structure is concerned by Rosalind Franklin in 1952, and here you can see the photo that she took, which clearly showed that the only way this could be would be the twisted um, ladder uh, that we now know as DNA. Uh, because DNA is golden mean, then scalar energy will implode into the center. So when we look at DNA from the top like this instead of from the side, we can see that there's this hole and scalar energy will implode inside of it to charge it up. Now, our muscles are rechargeable batteries, as I mentioned, that are stacked on top of each other like batteries in a flashlight to form a battery pack. So, for example, this one called the spleen meridian. Um, it uh, starts down in the big toe, uh, goes up the inside of the leg, a special branch over to the reproductive area, around to the back, etc. So here we can see that an acupuncture meridian is simply a stack of muscle batteries. Now, this uh, spleen meridian, as I mentioned, starts in the big toe, goes up the uh, inside of the leg, a special branch over to the female genitalia, it goes around to the back where it gets the adrenal glands, the spleen and the pancreas. Then it goes on up into the neck and makes a loop into what's called the stomach circuit. The stomach circuit then 
gets the frontal lobes of the brain, the macula and cornea of the eye, the thyroid, the breast, the stomach, the male genitalia, and then back down to the big toe. So as you can see then, we have uh, a, a multitude of important organs on this spleen stomach circuit. It's the entire reproductive system. It is the entire endocrine system, the thinking part of the brain, um, the thyroid, uh, etc. So the um, spleen stomach circuit supplies the minus 25 millivolts needed for all the organs on the circuit to work and also the minus 50 millivolts needed to make new cells to keep these organs repaired. Um, so we get into trouble when this battery pack cannot hold a charge because then you don't have the necessary voltage to run the organ and you don't have the, the minus 50 millivolts you need to make new cells to make repairs when either the cells wear out or the organ becomes damaged. So when this battery pack or any battery pack cannot hold a charge, you have chronic illness in one or more of these organs. So we have six of these loops of muscle battery packs that provide all the ongoing voltage for all the organs to work and to repair themselves. When you have a chronic disease, you must ask two questions. Number one, what is the power supply to the malfunctioning organ? And number two, why won't that battery pack hold a charge? So here are the images of these uh, six loops of uh, batteries to, that provide the voltages to all the organs. And all of these images are in um, my book, Healing is Voltage, Acupuncture Muscle Batteries. Now there's a main cable that goes around the body, it goes up the back and down the front. And then uh, you can see that the muscle battery packs here, for example, from the arms, from the right arm comes up to these various terminals, and the left arm comes up to these various terminals that are above the diaphragm, and then the muscle battery packs from the legs come up to these various terminals that are below the diaphragm. Once the voltage gets to these lateral terminals, it then comes into the center terminal, and now it can go around the body. And as it goes uh, around the body, uh, the body then can shift voltage from one organ system to another. As it goes up the back, you can see these little tiny muscles here uh, that go down and attach to the autonomic ganglia. And from the autonomic ganglia, they go down to every organ in the body. So this is the way that uh, the body is wired up. This is the wiring system of the body and the muscle battery pack system of the body that provides the energy for all of the organs to work. So how do we know if a, the voltage in an organ is low? Well, we can measure it with a device called a Mead or with a similar device called uh, a Vol device. Uh, the, um, with these devices, we're able to measure the voltages in the various circuits. One of the th issues with these measurement devices is that none of them can tell you whether the voltage you're measuring is electron donor or electron stealer, and we'll discuss that in some more detail as we go through the lecture. So when you um, have a chronic disease, you ask, well, what's the power supply to that organ? So for example, if you have heart pain, then you will want to know what's the voltage in the heart meridian. So you go measure it, and indeed you'll find that the voltage is low. And then you ask, well, why won't the heart battery pack hold a charge? Otherwise, our heart could be functioning normally. So while we're figuring out why the battery packs won't hold a charge, we start the process of correcting and recharging them. We recharge the cell membranes, the ATP, ADP battery, and the DNA batteries with the biotransducer. This is an attachment that hooks into the biomodulators. And this attachment puts out both electromagnetic energy, but also scalar energy. And therefore, it's very effective in charging up the cells. After we've spent a little bit of time charging up the cells, then we want to recharge the muscle battery packs that go to these various cells. So here you can see how you can aim the biotransducer at the organ that's malfunctioning. I like to use Infinity or the 783 harmonics 
and then use delta theta and alpha frequency sets if you have the um, professional model. If you just have the slimline model as you see pictured here, just run it in infinity. And then use 10.8 for the patches to recharge the muscle battery packs. So you plug the patch wires into the biomodulator and each plug set has a red and black connector. You use the next charge to apply the patches, paying attention to the color codes. Put your biomodulator to 10.8, bring the power up until you can barely feel it tingle in one of the patches and then run it for several hours to recharge the muscle battery packs. So here you can see uh, the red or black uh, coding to show you uh, where how to wire the person up in order to recharge the muscle battery packs. And um, you would wire front to back. So um, here you can see uh, the, the back ones. And notice that all of our organs are wired in a very specific order to form what are called Tesla resonating circuits. So for example, the um, parasympathetic is always wired to the sympathetic. The lungs always wired to the large intestine. The heart's always wired to the small intestine. The spleen pancreas is always wired to the stomach. The kidney is always wired to the bladder. And then liver and gallbladder are in inconvenient locations. And so if we go back to this chart, you can see that you can actually wire them here uh, where it says liver, gallbladder, and the sixth or seventh intercostal space to recharge those organs since it's inconvenient to put patches on the top of the head or in the perineum. Now all of these various circuits go through very specific teeth and the teeth have the ability to eventually act like circuit breakers. So the uh, circuits we've been talking about are this uh, spleen stomach circuit and those would be these teeth in yellow, the upper molars and lower premolars. So the teeth contain a pump that pumps fluid from inside the tooth to inside the mouth to prevent decay. Dr. Steinman at the dental school in Loma Linda proved this by um, injecting uh, acroflavin hydrochloride into the abdominal cavity of rats and recovering it in the dentin tubules within six minutes and in the enamel within an hour. And so he believed that this is a self-cleaning mechanism that prevents decay and is much more important as far as preventing cavities than the amount of uh, sugars that you eat. Um, here's uh, the uh, listing of his um, research. So when we ask the question, why won't the battery pack hold a charge? What we're finding is that most chronic disease actually begins with an emotional event which causes a magnetic field to get stuck in a tooth. Now, motions are stored in the body as magnetic fields. And the emotions or a magnetic field of an emotion blocks the flow of electrons through a tooth, lowering the voltage in that circuit and in that tooth. And of course, when you lower the voltage, it blocks the, the uh, dental pump allowing for decay and dental infections to occur and further lowering the voltage in that circuit. So the theory I'm presenting to you today is that almost all chronic disease begins with an emotion trapped in a tooth. So again, emotions are stored in the body as a magnetic field and the uh, magnetic fields of emotions are stored in specific teeth depending upon the emotion. An emotional magnetic field in a tooth lowers its voltage, turning off the dental pump that prevents decay. Even without decay, the lowering of voltage starts the cascade that we'll describe uh, below with lowering of oxygen, decrease in ATP, presence of cell wall deficient organisms, and eventually malignancies. So there can be events that start the lowering of voltage in circuits that don't relate to emotional trauma. For example, you get radiated from Fukushima nuclear plant and you weren't aware of the radiation. That's going to make you sick, even though it's not an emotional event. Um, or you eat GMO foods and are poisoned by glyphosate. Or you're vaccinated. These things generally don't uh, 
aren't accompanied by an emotional, but nevertheless, these poisons can lower your voltage and cause disease. So various poisons is, is an additional factor beyond emotions that cause chronic disease. But as the voltage in the circuit is blocked by an emotional magnetic field, the lowering of voltage starts the cascade of chronic disease. So here we can see that cells are designed to run between minus 20 and minus 20 millivolts, which is the same as saying between 7.35 and 7.44 uh, pH. Now, as voltage in the cell begins to drop, you get tired, then you get sick, and then the organ begins to malfunction. And finally, when you drop all the way down to plus 30 millivolts is where you get a malignancy. Now, when you drain any rechargeable battery to zero, it causes it to reverse its polarity. And the reversal of polarity tells stem cells that you're running out of oxygen and causes the stem cells to create a placenta uh, in an effort to restore the necessary oxygen so that organ can survive. So in my opinion, all solid tumors are, are placentas. All, in other words, all cancers that are solid tumors are placentas are, and are the effort of the body to overcome hypoxia. Now, as far as the way voltage works, if you think about my thumb, it's a good thumb, and then I hit it with a hammer. And when I do, the voltage is going to go up to minus 50 millivolts uh, because that's what's required to heal. But minus 50 millivolts causes arterioles to dilate, and that gives us the sign of inflammation. There's swelling, it's red, it's um, warm, it has a pulsing pain. And so it gets busy and starts replacing the cells you destroyed with a hammer. And eventually when those are all replaced, the thumb comes back to normal and you're happy. But if you hit your thumb with a hammer or have some other thing that causes damage to, the, to an organ, but you don't have the available 50 millivolts, then you're stuck down here in chronic disease. And no matter what you do, you can't overcome the chronic disease until you restore the 50 millivolts that's necessary for healing to occur. Now, when voltage drops, uh, the oxygen drops because the amount of oxygen that will dissolve in water is dictated by the voltage of the water. So if you take a glass of water and you put a tube in it and start bubbling oxygen into it, the amount of oxygen that will dissolve is dictated by the voltage. If you raise the voltage, more oxygen goes into solution. If you lower the voltage, the oxygen comes out of solution and goes away. So as we lower the voltage in our cells, the cells become hypoxic. There's another issue called the Bohr effect, which has to do with how uh, oxygen uh, attaches itself to hemoglobin. And so the higher the voltage, the more oxygen that will attach to hemoglobin. But when we get into the periphery, you need some CO2 to lower the voltage to allow the hemoglobin to uh, be able to disassemble itself from the hemoglobin. And that's called the Bohr effect. Now, the efficiency of metabolism is controlled by oxygen, which is controlled by voltage. So as I mentioned, inside of our mitochondria, we have these rechargeable batteries. When it's charged up, it's called ATP. When it's discharged, it's called ADP. And so we obviously need a battery charger. And so we have a thing called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. So for every unit of, of fat we put into the uh, Krebs cycle. If oxygen is present, we get enough electrons to charge up 36 to 38 uh, of these ATP batteries. But if oxygen is unavailable for every unit of fat we put in, we only get enough electrons to charge up two of these battery packs. So when voltage drops and oxygen drops, then our metabolism becomes very inefficient. And uh, it's sort of like having a car that goes from 36 miles a gallon to 2 miles a gallon. The other thing that happens when oxygen drops is that bugs show up. Our bodies contain about a trillion bugs and they're suppressed by oxygen. Most are cell wall deficient so the immune system can't see them and they don't cause a fever or change on our blood profile. But when oxygen levels drop, they wake up and want to have lunch. Here you can see with phase contrast microscope red blood cells that are 
uh, infested with these uh, cell wall deficient organisms and as they consume the um, nutrients in the cell you can see how this red blood cell gets smaller you can see this white blood cells going by and can't even see these uh, because uh, the immune system depends on cell membranes for identification here you can see in this slide um, where spirochetes are crawling out of the red blood cells once the uh, blood has been left underneath the cover slip long enough for the oxygen to be consumed. Here you can see uh, fungal uh, particles in a, a person that has uh, leukemia. And uh, these uh, fungus is always associated with uh, dead or dying uh, cells, uh, organic material, and they always show up when a voltage drops to plus 30 millivolts. Um, this is a microscope that's capable of seeing uh, in, uh, in uh, lifetime, real-time action without any stains or chemicals. And what you can see is, first of all, you can see what bone looks like and why it's important in uh, dentistry to use ozone so that uh, ozone being a gas will percolate back through all of this bony structure and kill any infection and then you can also see as we look a bit further the fungal forms that are beginning to show up as you see here and then you can see here the mycelial fungal forms that show up with malignancies so cell wall deficient organisms can only be cultured if you add antibiotics to the culture medium. They do not cause the usual signs of infection of elevated temperature, increased white blood count, right or left ship of WBC, etc. You cannot kill them with antibiotics. They can only be killed with oxidative therapies um, by raising the voltage and oxygen levels or the use of specific frequencies. So while the lowering of voltage progresses from discomfort to organ malfunction, dental infections are progressing as well. So if you think about this car battery that has corrosion around the terminal, it's hard for the alternator to keep this battery charged up. Well, this tooth up here is attached to a muscle battery as well. And as corrosion gets worse over time in either the automobile battery or in your teeth, it gets harder and harder to keep the associated battery packs charged. And eventually when the corrosion goes out and corrodes through the battery cable, now you have a short circuit and the car won't start at all. This happens in the human when you have infection spread from inside the tooth to the bone around the tooth. Now, all root canal teeth get infected because they're dead. All dead tissue gets infected. In addition, all root canal teeth are still attached to the lymphatics and circulation at the tips down here, as you can see. So even though you rip out the artery and rip out the nerve, there's still a connection. So you have an easy access through both the vascular system and the lymphatic system to bring infectious materials into the dead tooth. And... Um, then as uh, over time as this dead tooth becomes more and more infected throughout all these tubules eventually the infection is going to spread into the bone and once it spreads into the bone now you have a short circuit and that is capable of quickly dropping the voltage from electron donor to electron stealer and as i've discussed in the past uh, at this conference 95 uh, percent of patients have a root canal or a cavitation in the same acupuncture circuit as their primary cancer or in the tooth next door. Here, of course, you can see the study that was done where they were going to uh, pull wisdom teeth. They did a root canal on one side. 150 days later, they pulled the, the wisdom teeth. This one that had nothing done to it, only 1% of the tubules are infected. This one that had a root canal done 150 days earlier, 39% of the tubules are infected. And as Boyd Haley has shown, one root canal shuts down 63% of your immune system. So here you can see with infection into the bone, either from a root canal 
or from a cavitation where a tooth was pulled, uh, then at that point the tooth acts like a circuit breaker and very quickly drops the voltage in that circuit and now you have uh, systemic disease. So uh, one of the issues of course is when you pull the teeth leaving the ligament behind makes it harder for it to heal but even if you take the ligament out because it's an open wound into the mouth which is is terribly dirty, it's common to get infections if you don't use ozone and platelet-rich fibrin at the time of the extraction. Another problem is that the uh, cavitation can spread to the next door neighbor. So commonly a wisdom tooth will eventually move over and take out the spleen stomach circuit uh, on the uh, maxillary area and on the mandibular side it'll come take out the lung large intestine circuit. So of course, uh, dentists tend to take x-rays and sometimes you can see, particularly with a cone beam scan, uh, you can see a cavitation, but sometimes you can't. So for a long time now, I've recommended that people use the O-ring test because it seems to be more accurate than the x-ray. So when you put a ring and index finger together and be strong, and then you take your index and middle finger and touch over a tooth, for example, here over a wisdom tooth, and now you go weak, that is evidence that that circuit is short-circuited. Now, uh, um, for many years, I believe that this was prima facie evidence of uh, an infection in the tooth. Uh, I have to tell you that I believe I was wrong because what I'm finding is that there are often this test will fail or the patient will fail this test, but nothing has been done to the tooth and nothing can be found uh, on x-ray and yet you still fail this test. And what I've come to realize is that it's the emotional magnetic fields that get stuck in the teeth that um, cause the voltage to drop. So the, you can have a tooth that fails this O-ring test and it's, that's caused by an emotional blockage and there's no infection involved at this point. I do believe that the emotion is the root cause that eventually will cause the voltage in that tooth to drop and then begin, uh, the tooth will eventually get decay and go down that pathway. And then of course the things we've discussed um, will, uh, where you have lack of voltage, then lack of oxygen, then the, the voltage continues to drop, the cell wall deficient organisms show up, etc. So what we found is that if we remove the emotional blockage and you still fail the O-ring test, you likely have infection in the bone. But if you remove the emotion and now the test, the O-ring test goes from, from abnormal back to normal, one can make the assumption that the problem was the emotional blockage. Now different researchers are, have identified which emotions are stored in which circuits. Traditional Chinese medicine says that anger is stored in the liver gallbladder, fear in the bladder, worry in the uh, spleen stomach, lack of joy in the heart small intestine, grief in the lung large intestine, anxiety in the uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic systems. Uh, Dr. Banas uh, suggested uh, a different set of, uh, of observations about uh, the, which emotions are stored in which circuits, and he published that in his book, New Life Through Energy Healing. Uh, Eileen uh, McCusack uh, developed what is called biofield tuning, and this is her observations. Uh, of which emotions get stuck in which uh, circuits. Another thing that's interesting that Mikusik has noted is that if you have an emotion that's related to your father, it tends to get stuck on the right side of your body. And if it's related to your mother, it tends to get stuck on the left side of your body. So sometimes you'll find that you have a circuit that is normal on one side and uh, and uh, abnormal on the other side. The other thing that McCusick points out is that we have this magnetic field around us, which some call the aura, 
but that it goes out to approximately five feet or so and that uh, represents birth and up against the body represents today. So uh, our emotions get stored, uh, represented f from the teeth all the way out into this uh, field and uh, these distortions can be identified uh, with a variety of different techniques. So it's a little bit like having an orchestra that uh, has one instrument that's out of tune. So when you're listening to them play, you can, you actually are drawn to the instrument that's making the noise and not the music. Well, as you go through out here, you can find the date at which the, uh, that emotion uh, was evolved and because it's a distortion compared to being a normal um, uh, resonant music. So how do you erase these emotions? Well, various groups have worked to erase these EFT, Psych-K, Emotion Code, Psychosomatic Energetics, Bach Flowers, Biofield Tuning, and so forth. Biofield Tuning uses the scalar energy of sound to erase the emotions. But uh, emotional magnetic fields can be erased by another stronger magnetic field. And characteristic of most of the various methods of removing emotions is that patients must think of the emotional events while the therapeutic magnetic field is applied. Uh, some of the emotions we can remember and some have a wall around them so we can't remember them. Asking questions about events such as time, place, people involved and so forth can help unlock the memory so they can be erased. Now, I discovered that when I helped a patient identify emotion, they could hold on to these handlebars attached to the biomodulator and while thinking about the emotion for about 10 minutes with the device running in bioterminal step mode, it would erase that emotion. As I mentioned, uh, Eileen McCusick has been using tunic forks to find and erase these emotions. And again, you can see from this diagram that the wisdom teeth are heart, small intestine, and the autonomic nervous system. Well, what we find is that when you identify uh, emotions, if you simply use the biotransducer and aim it at the wisdom teeth, um, that uh, it will begin the process of erasing all, uh, many of these emotions. Now, if you take a pendulum and hold it over a bioterminal. Um, it should spin clockwise. Here you can see it's spinning counterclockwise over the small intestine circuit. So we're putting voltage in with the biotransducer into the wisdom teeth until you see it do what it just did. It reversed and now it goes clockwise. So again, you measure the bioterminals. Those you'll find that many of them are spinning counterclockwise, which means they're electron stealer and then you simply go put the biotransducer over the wisdom teeth and hold the, the uh, pendulum over uh, one of the circuits that's spinning backwards and the most common one I use is a small intestine and I hold the biotransducer there until it corrects the spin. Once the spin is corrected you go do the opposite side and then what you'll find is just correcting the wisdom teeth corrects essentially all of the terminals, all of the circuits in the body automatically and erases many of the emotions. Then you can still come back and find any remaining emotions and erase them. So there are still some issues to be resolved with my theory. Uh, what happens to an emotion when the tooth is pulled? Does that take the emotion with it or is it still uh, is the emotion still there and this is some work we still need to do. We need to identify emotions in a person that's going to have a, a, an extraction, not treat it, but then have the dentist pull the tooth and then go back and see if the emotion went with the tooth. Another thing is that um, we're not quite sure um, whether or not um, if you correct the polarity in a circuit that has a cavitation, will the cavitation heal without surgery? So we're in the process of taking cone beam scans, finding cavitations, but not treating them surgically, just treating the emotion in that circuit 
and then wait a few months and take another cone beam scan and see if the cavitation healed. So stay tuned. Um, so since the polarity of every circuit in the body can be corrected with a few minutes treatment of the wisdom teeth areas with a biotransducer, it seems logical to do this every few months or weeks to help prevent chronic disease. In addition, of course, it would be very useful for dentists to have a um, technician in their office that could treat uh, the bowling ball, which helps uh, uh, align the uh, bite and also then treat the wisdom teeth with a biotransducer to help turn on voltage in all the circuits because when the voltage is in the circuits whatever the dentist is going to do to a tooth is going to work better because you've automatically corrected the voltage to make it heal properly. Well uh, this is uh, the end of the time I have but uh, if you want to learn more about golden mean, implosion into cells, the bowling ball syndrome, and so forth, you can see the uh, representatives of the Synergy Medical Group, and they can help direct you to more of my videos about this subject. Thank you for allowing me to present uh, this important change in paradigm to uh, this dental group. Be well.